at 2 Samuel chapter 11. And as you are turning there this morning, I want to really uh, just read to you a passage out of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, that I kind of think uh, kind of tie in with this message I'm going to preach this morning. Uh, The writer of Hebrews says uh, in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? This passage warns us about the problem of spiritual drifting and the need to pay very, very close attention to our spiritual walk. One of the most common myths among Christians is that occasionally there'll be followers of Christ that just suddenly and seemingly without warning fall away from Christ and in to sin. We've all seen people, or at least probably have heard uh, about people. We've seen over the uh, past uh, number of years a number of prominent Christian leaders who have fallen into a, a grave and destructive sin. And if you look at those situations from a distance, if you kind of uh, stand back away from them and you only see them from a distance, it sort of appears that their fall came rather sudden, that they just almost, they got up one morning and decided they were going to sin and, and then fell. And uh, But if we were to take a a little closer look at that, if we were to really zoom in and watch their lives over a a period of time, what we would see is that sin, falling into sin, is actually a process. Falling away from Christ and and falling away, and I'm talking to Christians this morning, Uh, when we fall away and we slip into what I call spiritual drifting, it doesn't happen overnight it happens gradually over a period of time. We could probably use the, uh, the, the old analogy of the frog in the kettle. You've probably all heard that uh, the cliche uh, used a, a, a thousand times. You know, they say if you take a frog and you throw him in a pot of boiling water. Now, by the way, I don't know what kind of person is taking frogs and throwing them in boiling water, okay? Uh, but they say if you do, the frog jumps right back out. And you can imagine that. Uh, If you go down to a swimming pool and you jump into a swimming pool and the water is ice cold, you jump right back out, right? Uh, I remember many years ago, we were down in in Florida, and uh, it was very, very early in the spring, and we were in northern Florida, and uh, our son, Matt, wanted to go swimming. I said, the water's going to be cold, Matt. He said, no, uh, it'll be fine. And I remember um, there have been two people that walked on water that I'm sure of. Jesus walked on water, and Matt Buchanan walked on water. He jumped in that water, and uh, it was so cold, he just danced right across the top of it. Uh, uh, Frog, you throw him in hot water, he jumps right back out. But if you put him in a a, a bowl of very comfortable temperature water, just the, the right temperature for frogs to enjoy, and you slowly and gradually turn up that uh, temperature one degree at a time, very slowly, and you allow him to acclimate, that frog will sit in that boiling water until he boils to death. That's a good analogy of what happens in our spiritual life. It doesn't happen overnight that we fall into sin, but but what happens is there is this slow, gradual process. Satan doesn't really aim uh, so much to just fall in in one grand motion or or one big event, but, but instead he leads us slowly and gradually down the path of temptation towards spiritual drifting. You think about that with Eve. Sometimes we look at Eve, the fall of Eve and the sin, and and we see the fall, but we don't pay attention to the fact that there was a process leading up to that. Uh, Satan was very carefully cultivated some questions in her mind and began to plant some thoughts in her mind that gradually led her to sin. Uh, That's the way it is in our life. 
if we do not pay very close attention to what we've heard and, and to our spiritual life, we will drift away. We are, we're very much like a ship that lets loose of its moorings and gets carried away by the tide. We must pay very, very close attention, the Bible says, to our spiritual life. So what I want to do this morning is go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I would like to, to use the case of David and Bathsheba as a case study for spiritual drifting. I'd like us to just kind of walk through the steps that David took and see the key waypoints along the way, to see those key markers, those key places where David uh, began to fall into problems. Then I would like us to, to encourage us to examine our own lives and to see where we uh, drift and where we uh, have maybe uh, started that process in our own walk with Jesus. So let's start. Let's look at the five steps of spiritual drifting. The first one is being lazy. Look what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. The Bible says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained at at Jerusalem. It's a very telling verse. It reminds us that David wasn't where he was supposed to be, and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing. This was a time uh, of the year. It was the spring of the year when kings go out to war. And the writer puts that in there. The Holy Spirit inspired the writer of 2 Samuel to put that there to remind us that David was neglecting his duty. He was the king. He was the leader. In all of other uh, Israel's battles, since he had been king, he had led them. He had been out there on the forefront. He had been very diligent to be there doing his duty. But this time, instead of going out to battle, he sends someone else. He sends Joab out to do his fighting for him. And he remains in Jerusalem. David got lazy. Instead of doing what he was supposed to be doing and being where he was supposed to be uh, uh, at the time, David stayed home. Can I tell you what? That is generally the first step in spiritual drifting. We just get kind of lax. We just kind of get a a, a little bit uh, uh, lazy about what we're doing. And and suddenly we're not doing the things that produce spiritual growth. We get lazy about our church attendance. We get lazy about our Bible reading. We get lazy about our prayer life. We get lazy about our fellowship with other believers. We get lazy about the ministry uh, that we're supposed to do. I I remember many, many years ago, uh, there was an older pastor that I had met and uh, uh, we, we were talking, and, and uh, there were three of us standing there in this conversation. Uh, uh, there was a guy named uh, 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 Richard Harris, who was our director of missions, and this older pastor. And this older pastor said, well, when you guys get as old as I am, you won't even have to prepare sermons anymore. You can just warm up things that you had in the past. And I'll never forget Richard looking at me, and he said, don't ever become like that guy. Don't ever become that guy. He said, that guy has gotten so lazy. And here's what he said. He said, his spiritual life has just dried up. What happened? He he thought there was a point in his life where he could just sit back and he could kind of take it easy. That's a major problem among Christians today. There was a day in the history of the church when we understood that the primary responsibility for teaching children doctrine and for teaching children the gospel and for taking care of their spiritual life belonged to the parent. Somewhere along the line, we gave that over to a Sunday school teacher. And what happened? Parents got lazy. There was a day when we thought, well, worship was about something that that I have to be involved in and something that I have to bring uh, when I come. And and it's not something that I, I have done to me, it is something that I bring with me. Uh, There was a time when we understood that it was our job not to just be taught the Bible, but to study the Bible and to dig into it and to learn it. There was a day when we understood that it was not about just making things attractive so that people would come, but that we would go. 
we have gotten lazy in our spiritual life. Now, here's the danger. Laziness leads to indifference. And indifference will carry us down the path of spiritual drifting towards sin. Amos chapter 6 verse 1 says, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion. And Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 12 says, And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Those are both passages that warn us about this very spirit that kind of takes over our spiritual life now and then, and we just get complacent, we get rather satisfied with ourselves, and we get rather lazy in our spiritual life, and before too long, we've fallen into the trap of spiritual drifting. It takes effort, brothers and sisters, to make progress in the spiritual life. It takes effort. And somewhere along the line, in our zeal to understand that God has to work in and through us, we we have to recognize this, that 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 does not mean that we are idle in the process. Yes, God produces the growth. Yes, we can do nothing apart from Christ. Those things are all true. But the reality of it is, is that there is also a part of this that we have to put ourselves in a position so that we can be blessed, so that we can grow. It takes effort uh, to get up in the morning and to pray. Did you know that? Prayer doesn't just happen by accident. If you're just waiting for your prayer life to get better, it'll never get better. What do you have to do? You have to take an effort And some days, you meet God and it is glorious. Have you ever been there? You get alone before God and you start to pray and it's just like God shows up in the room. But can I say this? There are days when it'll feel like your prayers have never even gotten above the ceiling of your bedroom. There'll be days when you wonder whether God even heard you. But there is still the importance of even on those days, even on those days when you're not feeling it, that you still continue to pray. It takes effort to read your Bible. Amen? You have to pick the book up. You have to open the page. Well, you don't anymore. You don't even have to open it up. You have to turn it on. Right? You can turn the iPad on. You gotta, you gotta turn your phone on. You gotta, you gotta open your Bible. You've got to make the effort. It does not read itself. It does not just leak into you. It takes effort. You have to put effort into worship. This is not a spectator sport. You have to put effort if you want your children to grow up godly. You have to put effort if you want your marriage to survive and thrive. You have to put in effort if you want to grow in your experience of God. And what's happened sometimes is we sit back and we think, I'm not growing, it must be somebody else's fault. I'm not growing, so my Sunday school teacher isn't doing his job. I'm not growing, so the pastor isn't doing his job. I'm not growing, so, uh, uh, so, you know, someone else isn't doing their job. The reality is, is we must bring some effort We must get on our knees before God with our open Bibles and we must search them and and we must put in the effort towards spiritual growth. There's a second thing. Not only did David get lazy, but there's good evidence here that David got bored. Look at verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch. What was David doing in the middle of the afternoon? What was that verse hint that David was doing? Middle of the afternoon, what was David doing? He got up from his couch. David was sleeping. (laughs) He's in the middle of the afternoon. He's taking a nap. Now, by the way, there are days when it's a good thing to take a nap. Amen? Sunday afternoon is a good day to take a nap, right? I I used to do that all the time. Then I'm too groggy on Sunday night now, uh, so I don't do that as much as I used to. But but it's good to occasionally take a nap. But, But David is the king. The armies of Israel are in the field doing battle. You would think that that David would sort of be, if he's not going to be there in battle, at least be sort of alert. But look what happens. He he gets off, off his couch, and he was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Laziness will lead us towards boredom. Notice that David is just kind of rambling around on his rooftop. This is kind of almost a picture of someone that's kind of aimless. 
He doesn't have any objective, doesn't have any plan for the day. So he's just kind of wandering around. He's looking on his rooftop. And, and uh, uh, my dad used to say it this way, looking for what kind of trouble he could get into. Just kind of looking around, so wondering, and he's kind of bored. Boredom is a result. Once we've got lazy, we've got bored. He has no purpose, no plan for the day. He's just wasting time. Too lazy and too indifferent to go out to war to do what he was supposed to do. Now he gets bored. And when we get bored, we open our minds to Satan's attack. Here's what we have to understand, folks. Much of the spiritual battle that we are engaged with begins in our minds. It starts right here. The old saying that idle hands are the devil's workshop is absolutely true. But it's not your hands, it's your mind. Well, what he does is he begins to start, and, and, he, and he puts David in a situation where David uh, sees something. Now, uh, we'll talk about that here in just a couple of moments, but, but, but uh, now that he's bored, Satan can come in and begin to work on him. And, and you know, that's true. Over the years of ministry, I've noticed something. Uh, people who are busy in the church often don't get themselves in trouble. Amen? They don't get in trouble. They don't get themselves tied up in division. They don't get themselves tied up in the sin. Why? They've been too busy serving the Lord, too busy uh, reading their Bible, too busy praying, too busy serving, too busy being involved uh, that they don't have time uh, for Satan to come along and distract them over into some area of sin. Now, I'm not saying... That, that people can't be very active and still fall into sin. But I'm saying that it's more prevalent when people get bored. Time after time, we read the accounts of spiritual leaders, pastors, evangelists, Bible teachers who have fallen into sin. And their story is almost always the same. At some point in their life, they got a little bit lazy about what they were doing and got bored, and Satan opened them up with some distraction, something to just kind of give them a momentary buzz, a momentary bit of excitement in their life. When we're bored, we are open to Satan's door. The best way to keep from getting bored is learn how to use our time wisely. Time cannot be saved, only invested. Every moment of your life, every moment that ticks off your life is gone forever. Have you ever thought about that? I don't know how many years you've got. You know, what's the average lifespan for people in their mid-60s? Uh, women live a little bit longer with men than men do. That's because men have to live with women. You can yell at me later, I know, I, I know. I, I'll read the letters, all right? Just joking. I don't know why that is, honestly, but women live just a little bit longer than men on average. But think about that. That's not very long. 60-some years, 70 years, 80 years, even if you live into your 90s, that's not a very long period of time. And every single minute that goes by in your life, that's a minute that you'll never get back. Every hour is an hour you'll never get back. Every day is a day you'll never get back. And that's why the Bible is very careful to tell us, use our time wisely. In Ephesians chapter 5, where, where Paul's talking about spiritual attack and the armor of God, one of the things that he says there is, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. And listen to what he says, making the best use of time. I like how the King James translates that, redeeming the time. What does it mean? Purchasing it back, using it for God's glory, using every moment that you have in this life understanding that, that it's a minute that you'll never get back. It's a day that you'll never get back. And so uh, David, he's just kind of wasting a day away, and Satan comes in there. And by the way, Satan never wastes a day. <laughs> he never, never sleeps. He never slumbers. Every single moment, he plots and he plans against your life, and he works. And on the day that you get bored, and on the day that you've gotten lazy, he will seize the day. 
He will use it. And David discovers that in a rather tragic way. So the answer is, invest our time. Use it wisely. Get in there and spend our time with God and, and get involved in the ministry and get involved in the service of the king. And get involved uh, in, in the spiritual things that can keep our minds focused. The third thing that happens, not only did he get lazy and bored, but then he got curious. The old saying says, curiosity killed the cat. Verse 3, notice what happens. And David sent and inquired about the woman. Did you notice what happened? He sees her. Now he's inquiring of her. Hey, who is that? Who's that lady over there on that rooftop? Now listen, the right thing for him to do when he saw a naked lady over there taking a bath on the rooftop over on the other way was to cover his eyes and walk away. It wasn't his wife. That was somebody else's wife. He shouldn't be looking where he's looking, but, 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 but he saw it. And, and, but instead of, of immediately dealing with that sin, instead of immediately taking the thought captive, and, instead of immediately dealing with it, David gets curious about it. I wonder who she is. And, and so he inquires of her. And then notice what happens. He uh, inquired about the woman. And one said, is this not that Sheba, the daughter of Eliam? You read right past that. Eliam was one of David's most trusted advisors. David was friends with her dad. That's what that means. Isn't this the daughter of Eliam? And not only that, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Uriah is one of his generals. David knows her dad, and he's known him for years. He knows her husband, and, and notice what happens. That still doesn't stop David. David has gotten curious about sin. He started to think about it. Once Satan has presented the temptation to David, the curiosity takes over. Actually, from this point forward, I don't know that Satan's even involved in this process. David takes over. You know, Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. The devil doesn't make anybody do anything. <laughs> That's the kick with the devil. He doesn't make you do anything. He just gives you the opportunity. He just lays the temptation in front of you. And he allows our own curiosity to begin to take over. And as David comes in, David fails to take the thought captive. He fails to get engaged in the battle. There's an old saying that says, you can't stop the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. We can't control what we see. There'll be times when you're going to see things that entice your flesh. In this case, it was a, a lady bathing. In your case, it may be something very, very different. You know, we all have our own temptations. We all have our own weaknesses. We all have uh, the, our own little strongholds in our life that kind of can capture us and to take us. And, and we can very fi easily find it uh, 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 very easy to judge someone else. Oh boy, that's the worst sin we could ever imagine. Look at what that guy did. But the reality is all sin is equally heinous in the eyes of God. And so what happens is you have your pets, I have my pets, you have your weaknesses, I have my weaknesses, and, and, and David had his. And what happens is David begins to mull this over. We can't control what we see, but we can control what we look at. That second and that third look, and I kind of imagine it was a little bit more uh, than that with David. I, I, I imagine that when he saw her, and I imagine it became more of a stare, <laughs> became more of a fascination. That first fleeting temptation that goes across your mind. Oftentimes you can't control that, but you can deal with what comes next. The first sight is often out of our control, but when we take that second look, it's a sign that curiosity has been stirred within our heart. I can't tell you the number of times that someone has come into my office to confess and talk about a deep-seated sin going on in their life, a habitual struggle that started just because they were curious. I hear things like this. I wanted to see what it would be like. 
all my friends were doing it, so I just kind of thought I would just dabble in it just once. I remember a young lady many years ago. I can't tell you her old story because it's so awful that I, you, just, you wouldn't even believe it if I told you the whole story. But I never forget her sitting in my office. She had gotten to a point where she had contracted a, 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 a sexually transmitted disease. She would never be able to have children at, a, again. Uh, at, well, at all. She didn't have any children. Would never be able to do that. She had lost her reputation. She had been horribly used. It was an awful situation. She had a drug problem that was going to require her to go into drug rehab. And I remember asking her, how did this happen? And she said, you know, it really started with when I went off to college, I was hanging out with some friends, and they were using some drugs. And I just got curious. I wondered what it would be like. And she said, after that first time, she said, I couldn't stop. It just took control. She said, I found that the next day I wanted to do the drug again, and the next day I wanted to do the drug again, and before too long, that amount of it didn't didn't take care of it, so I I, I took a little bit more. And then before too long, I started adding this onto it. Then I found that if I went to parties uh, and I was high, uh, then I became the life of the party, and she had always been very shy and very backward, kind of a wallflower type person, but when she was high, she could go to a party, and she'd become the life of the party. And it led her down to a path that she is still paying for to this very day. What happened? She got curious. I wonder what it would be like. I just do it once. I just try it. I'll just dabble in it a little bit. And, and that's kind of the, 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 the fourth stage. David thinks he can just kind of dabble with it. So in verse 4, you'll notice what he does. Uh, he says, so David sent messengers, and he took her, and he came to her, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness, and then she returned to her house. David just thinks, oh, I'm the king. I'm just going to dabble in this sin just a little bit. I'm going to sin for Bathsheba. I'm going to have an illicit affair, every, but it'll be okay. It's just this one time, just this one experience. There's our mistake. When we think we can dabble in sin, and think we can get away with it, we're deceived. David thinks he's just gotten away with it. Satan likes to convince us that there's no penalty for sin. Remember Eve? Satan says to her, you won't die if you eat that. God wouldn't kill you. God won't kill you for eating just a piece of fruit. I mean, come on. He's not going to do it. Satan loves to tell us there is no penalty for sin. Brothers and sisters, there is. And sometimes as believers, we buy into this mess. We think that we can sin and get away with it just because we believe that once we've been saved, we're always saved. Now, I believe in the doctrine of eternal security, but I want to tell you something. If you think you can sin and get away with it and there's no penalty, you're deceiving yourself. You will deal with the earthly penalty, the temporal penalty of your sin here on this earth. And there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of that. That. Thousands of examples of that. David thinks he can dabble in it just a little bit. And what happens? He ends up falling headfirst into it, and it becomes an overwhelming sin. Too often, too often, that's what happens with us. I'm curious about it. I wonder what it would be like. We dabble in it a little bit. Next thing we know, we're into it over our heads. We, we lose everything. Uh, it'll destroy us. He dabbled in it. And then look what happens. But he wasn't content there. <laughs> the, old, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Look what happens in verse 5. 
And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. From this point on, the story takes a horrible turn. David thought he could sin and get away with it. He thought he could dabble in it and be okay. But what happens? She gets pregnant. Does this sound like a soap opera? This sounds like an episode of Dallas, doesn't it? That sounds like something J.R. Ewing would do. you got to be a little older to understand that reference, all right? You young people don't know who J.R. Ewing was, but he was on TV a long time ago. Got shot. Still don't know who shot him. I don't. <laughs> I kind of got attracted to something else that rest of that summer and, and never got back to it that fall. Uh, but anyways, um, uh, the reality is, is he thought he'd get away with it, but now his sin is staring him right in the face. So what does David do? The next path in this process is this process of trying to cover up our tracks. This is where Satan really, really snags us. David doesn't want anybody to know what he's done. So, so you can go home and read this story later on, but, but let me just tell it to you really quick. David, David's immediately trying to think, how can I keep anybody from ever finding out what I did? Uh, I know. I'll send for Uriah. I'll have Uriah come back from the battlefield, and, and, and uh, you know what? He'll go, and he'll be with his wife that night, and everybody will think that it's his baby. Nobody will ever know. The only problem with David was he discovers that De Uriah was more righteous than him. Uriah shows back up and says, yes, king, what do you want? And the king throws a big banquet. He even tries to get Uriah drunk so that Uriah will go back home. What does Uriah do? Uriah spends the night guarding the palace of the king because here's what he says. He says, how in the world can I go out and enjoy uh, the, my home? How can I enjoy uh, uh, my wife? And, and the armies of Israel are out in the field of battle. So he stays. Look what he's doing. He's doing his job. He's protecting the king. He says, I'm not going to go back there. I'm not going to enjoy uh, my life when, when the army is out to battle. And, and what happens? The whole plan falls apart. <laughs> David's like, oh, man, what am I going to do now? <laughs> this is a great example of how far sin will take you. David, up to this point, this episode has been a pretty good king. He's been a man after God's own heart. But this is where sin will eventually take you. David says, then I have to get rid of Uriah. Now think about that for a moment. He doesn't have to kill Uriah. He sends word. He gives Uriah a note. He says, Uriah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take this note. Take it back to the general. Give that note to him. In that note is the command to the general to kill Uriah. Get him in the middle of the battle, and then everybody back away from him and let Uriah get killed. You know what he's trying to do? Let me say this. I don't think David's just trying to cover up his sin anymore. David wants to kill the very picture of righteousness that offends him so much. He's not covering up his sin anymore. David is saying, this man is more righteous than me, and he has that which offends him destroyed. That's a hard heart, brothers and sisters. That's an awful place to be. Now, by the end of this, by the way, there's good news in all of this. You say, preacher, that's the worst story I've ever heard. I can't believe that's in the Bible. That, is that how Christians act? No, this is how Christians act. God never allows us to get away with sin, so he raises up a prophet, a prophet named Nathan. And Nathan comes to David one night, and he tells him a story. And David recognizes immediately what the story is about. He said, uh, there was a man who had one little sheep, and there was another man who had a whole flock of sheep. And the man that had the whole flock of sheep wanted that one little sheep that the poor man had. And he went and he took it from him. And David says, I don't know who that man is, but we all have him killed. And Nathan says probably some of the most haunting words in all of the Bible. 
David, you are the man. David, that's you. David, you have a whole harem full of wives. He did. <laughs> you have all kinds of women that you could marry. That you, but here, you had to take Uriah, a faithful, loyal, righteous man. You took his wife, and you had him killed. And he says, David, there's uh, going to be some consequences to this. By the way, back up a little bit. David does the right thing in this situation. David repents. He doesn't harden up. He doesn't have Nathan killed. He doesn't say, no, Nathan, you don't know what you're talking about. He admits his sin and he repents. But there were still consequences to that sin. And David bore those consequences and he took them. And he took them like a man takes them. He didn't wilt under them. He understood there was a penalty. But you know what he did? He didn't continue in his sin. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. Brothers and sisters, we will all go down this path. We all drift spiritually. There'll be a day when you drift. There's a day I drift. There's been days that I've drifted. There's been days that you drifted. And the reason God puts this in the Bible is to remind us, even great men, great men of faith like David struggle with sin. And there's going to be moments where you drift down that path and where you fall into sin and you mess up. But don't stay there. Amen? Don't just harden up and continue down the path. Turn around. And if you want to read the story of David's repentance, go to Psalm 51. There is the psalm that David pens as he repents and he turns out of his sin and turns back to God. I remember many years ago, and I, I want to be careful how I say this because uh, I, I do not mean to get political about it. It's only an illustration, so don't, don't read anything political into this. But I remember a few years ago, do you remember when, when, when Bill Clinton had his tryst with Monica Lewinsky? You remember that? You remember what he said? He made his comparison between himself and David. Now, I don't know Bill Clinton's heart. I really don't, okay? At that time, I don't know that Bill Clinton was really using that analogy right. Yes, people, even great people, fall into sin. The difference was David showed clear, public repentance for his sin. It's not just enough to feel sorry. There must be a turning away and a turning back to God. And David did that. And David was a man after God's own heart. Amen? We all fall. We all struggle. We all go down this path of spiritual drifting. We, we want to ideally catch ourselves when the drift first starts. Amen? For started as soon as we notice we're getting a little bit, if you've been a little bit lazy and lax in your spiritual disciplines and, and in your church attendance and, and your walk with God, there's a warning that says, hey, man, um, you, you, you're on, in danger of going down this path. Stop. Turn around right now, avoid it. Avoiding it is always better than just plowing right into it, amen? <laughs> always better. Use some caution about it. If you're not, well, you say, well, I've kind of gone beyond that. I'm bored. Well, there's a warning. So there's a way marker there that says, hey, turn around from right here. But let's say you've gone down all the way down the path and you have fallen into some heinous, awful sin. And you're sitting there going, man, how in the world? Turn around. Amen? If God forgave David, he'll forgive you. He'll restore you. Isn't that the good news? See, this isn't a, this isn't a congregation of people who are perfect. This is a congregation of, of sinners. This is a, a congregation of human beings that are weak and frail, and they fall and they drift and it's not about saying, well, what will they think? What will they think? Well, if they're, if they're walking with God, they're going to say, hallelujah, that guy can't turn around. If they're not walking with God, it might be a warning, hey, maybe I better do that. Turn around. Stop where you're going and go the other direction. Amen? Let's stand. Every bed bowed, every eye closed.
Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for these words. Thank you for the example of King David. Not only the positive, but even here where we can watch how he fell into sin and yet how you lovingly, graciously restored him when he turned back. Lord, I pray today for the hearts of each and every person. I pray you'd search us, speak to us, show us those places where we're falling short. Show us where we've started to drift away from you and call us back into a deeper walk with you. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.